So this talk is on um, program synthesis with uh, pragmatic communication. And this is done with some of, um, I guess, with Amando, I'm, I'm Amando's uh, postdoc, but mostly done with some of Josh Tenenbaum's students who work on, you know, real um, human interactive cognitive setups and um, that kind of a flavor. And I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, talk. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here because this is really cool. I think it's amazing. Okay. And so let's let's go into it. Um, so. Um, let's first talk about the plan. So the, the plan for today, um, we'll first, you know, do some formalization of program synthesis as a communication task, right? So we, we use program to communicate with the computer. So why don't we think about synthesis as an act of uh, communication between users intent and some underlying program that can like represent and satisfy these kind of intents. And again, this also, I will explain the challenge of program synthesis, namely the one of ambiguity. I'm sure many, many of you have dealt with this problem before, and especially in dealing with user interactions. You know, I have a thousand programs that satisfy the spec. Like, do I show a thousand? Like, how do I rank them? And so this is a problem that's kind of very close and dear to the kind of stuff and research I work on. And um, I was thrilled that, you know, by using some pragmatics, you know, some principles of, you know, psychology and cognitive science, you can kind of resolve this problem in a clean way. And so essentially I will, you know, explain how pragmatics and a particular kinds of formalism called um, rational speech act. I will explain to you how, how it works and how it can, in some simple domain, resolve the problem of ambiguity almost right out of the box. And so in, in particular, right, RSA, um, Rational Speech Acts, um, defines a natural ranking function of program given utterances. So if the user uh, gives some utterances to a synthesizer, the RSA is a kind of a deterministic procedure that ranks the satisfying program in some way. And then, and this does not require any crafting of heuristics. So there's nothing about, oh, we want the shortest program or most relevant program. You, you don't need to do any of that. And um, it also does not require training on real human interaction, which is a huge plus because usually when you rank them, you can ask a user, well, you know, given this one, which one would you prefer? And then you can imagine with a lot of data, you could, you know, learn to rank them, but we don't really need that here as well. So it all seems kind of a magic, um, which is really cool. And uh, so I will explain how it works in, in like a mathematical sense. And then uh, I will outline how to properly instantiate rational speech acts in, in you know program synthesis and present some results of user study and think about some of the future work directions because um, there's no free lunch and the, the expensive part about RSA is in its uh, computation and then we have some preliminary ideas of how to amortize these inference and so maybe we can scale this to a, a, a real program synthesis uh, system and so uh, to start off with explaining pragmatics, it's important to have a cute example. And so here, here's an example. Here are three objects, A, B, and C. And then I tell you, I'm thinking of the, the black object. And so my question to you is, if I tell you, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about the black object, can you bring me the black object? Uh, which object uh, am I thinking of? Right? So. It, it, it's C, right? So like, you know, you know, despite the fact that both B and C are kind of ambiguous, uh, I, I actually meant C, right? Um, why is that? It's because, you know, if I were to refer to object B, I would have said the square object, right? So these kind of pragmatic inferences kind of going a step beyond about is more than what you just told me, but I also thought about what you didn't tell me. And from the knowledge of what you didn't tell me, I can disambiguate, right? So this is, I, I disambiguated two objects by thinking about, oh, well, you didn't say square, so it must be uh, C, right? And something like that. And so the high level, you know, message of this talk is we, we leverage these kind of reasoning in the context of program synthesis. And then um, let's just go straight into the demo uh, and show you how it works. And so we have a very simple, I mean, quite PR standard, like trivial, but, you know, uh, a program synthesis domain with pragmatics. So I'll show you the DSL and it's, you know, rendering. So this is a layout domain and the input is a X, Y coordinate and the output uh, is for this X, Y coordinate, which symbol should I place? So 
uh, once you generate from this grammar, uh, you will have a program that each time you give it a different x, y coordinate, it'll give you one of these symbols. They, they can be chickens and pigs, and they can be a colors, and they can be a pebble. So essentially, um, the patterns, uh, the four patterns you see on the right, is basically executing this program by feeding it all 49 grid in a three by three, uh, in, in, in a seven by seven grid, and with each x, y input, it says, okay, on this point, I should put on a, a particular symbol. Okay, so the inputs are uh, seven by seven uh, grids, and the output is a particular symbol. And so uh, we can do a kind of a program synthesis task by, by example, and I'll show you the demo. And so this is a, a, a version of pragmatic program synthesis by example. And so what's the task? The task is imagine you're trying to construct the pattern on the left. Um, so the pattern, um, you could see it, right? It contains chicken and pig in two colors. And then what, uh, what you can do to you know, tell the synthesizer which pattern uh, you're referring to, you're going to give the synthesizer some examples. So by that, I mean for some of these x, y coordinates, I'm going to drop some shapes. And so what are some good strategies you can talk to the synthesizer? Well, um, one good strategy to use, I guess is intuitive for human. Um, we also find it in the user study after certain rounds, human converge onto a kind of an intuitive strategy, which is I, I want to limit the size of the grid, right? And then by noticing some patterns on the corners and then fill in the center, right? So this is a particular uh, strategy. So um, let's try to fill in. So as you can see, just by putting down this green chicken, um, these two robots is giving me feedback of what program uh, it thinks that also off of the green chicken, right? And as you can see, the, the white robot is kind of confused, right? It's like, oh, is this like giant pattern with more things that you didn't say. And you can see the blue, the pragmatic one, is a lot more conservative, right? It's like, you know, since you only showed me one green chicken, maybe this is a simple pattern, right? So, and then what we can do is we can show the lower right corner. And you can see we're already very close, right? And um, essentially the analogy uh, we can make here is the white robot is something like Sketch, where it's giving you any program that satisfies uh, the example whereas the blue robot is ranking these satisfying program and it's ranking them by doing pragmatics reasoning. And so just to make it finish, um, we can give the one last example. So you can see with three uh, input output example, the blue robot by performing pragmatic computation can refer to the right object, whereas the white one is still kind of confused, but it's not wrong, right? It's giving you something that satisfies the spec, it's just not you know, pragmatically speaking, not what you want. So now to get the white robot to understand it, I think you could do it by forcing uh, the boundary using these pebbles. And so it's still kind of confused. Uh, we probably want to block out the bottom. Maybe like the right. See now, with three more examples, we are able to kind of force the white robot to do the right thing. And that's usually kind of the, I'm sure most of us have that experience with constraint solver, right? We need to over constrain the system so that it doesn't do something stupid. Right, otherwise, it'll give you like the easiest solution that, that doesn't make sense. Cool. So, so that's the demo, and so um, really, let's maybe just go into the main part of the talk, and I'll go the first part kind of quickly because this talk was originally given to some Coxi people. But what is a program? We know what a program is, right? But you know, under the communication framework, it's really a way for a person to command and talk to a computer, right? So essentially. If you're a user, you frame your intent as a piece of program, you give it to a computer and the computer executes. But you know, in general, maybe not too relevant to this crowd, but in general, we, at least Josh and Avon people, we think of program also as a fairly representative, like a nice way to represent general concepts. So I'll give you some example. Um, so I guess Autodesk example, right? So shapes can be programs. Um, so you can make this, you know, uh, microscope, I think, by taking some elementary uh, cylinders and, and then you, by performing Boolean algebra on them, you can you know, generate these. Um, and then you can also represent handwritten characters as a program, right? So there might be some primitive loops and curves and then you compose them together to make you know, complicated characters. And lastly, maybe in cognition, you could use program to represent some kind of core concept, right? So here, um, you know, these are kind of really program synthesis tasks with input and output and then 
the goal is to predict what's the missing block, right? And so there's some human cognition principle of symmetries and things, and if you know that, you could write the program to complete this task. Right? Um, but I guess we can meme it up and say, you know, if program is so nice, why don't we program all the time? And the fact is that it's hard, right? And this meme is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I got a bit from, from Reddit, I think it's funny, which is, you know, the computer literally tells, does what exactly you tell it to do, right? Which is kind of not very helpful. And so in some sense, you know, human machine communication is pretty literal and, and it's not pragmatic, right? The computer doesn't really, doesn't emphasize with you and it just be like, well, you told me that, so deal with it. And so this is where synthesis can help, right? At least that's the original motivation for synthesis where um, you know, all, all computer science problems are solved by indirection, so synthesizer can serve as the indirection between user and space of program, so the task will be the user gives some utterances to the synthesizer, and then given these utterances, you know, the synthesis system kind of index, right, I, I like that phrase, like index into the giant space of program uh, to pick the right one. So what you get from this kind of indirection is you can refer to program with a lot of other kind of utterances, right, rather than just code, right? So you could use constraints to talk about the program that you want, you could use examples and behaviors, and you can use sketches, natural language, and gestures, and so on and so forth, right? And so, um, so to frame it kind of like a communication task is called in, I guess, in cognitive science and so on, it's called a reference game. And so the goal is for a speaker and listener pair to collaboratively refer to the same object. So the user is trying to refer to a particular program, but the user cannot directly communicate the program to the synthesizer. So the user uses some alternative utterances to say something about the program. And then taking these utterances, the synthesizer, like, ah, you meant this program, and then it refers to a particular program, this space of program. And so so synthesis is really kind of this reference game where in the combinatorial space of terrible, terrible space of program, given some utterances, the, 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 the synthesizer need to say, oh, that's a program that you want, right? And so um, to be formal, the user, I will refer to as the speaker, so I'm speaking, and the synthesizer, I will refer to as the listener. So the synthesizer is listening, and this pair goes in this kind of unidirectional way from, from speaker to listener. And so, um, there's different kinds of program synthesis, which, you know, not too important, but it's cute to think about um, because we thought, we, we, you know, we said we can refer to program with different kind of utterances, right? And so it's nice to look at the literature and be like, well, what, what are some different kind of different kind of utterances that people do to refer to program? And so broadly speaking, I want to say um, there's two kinds of utterances and they demand different kinds of synthesis technologies. And so there is the trans translation kind, which is from natural language to program. Right? So here, the spec will be a sentence that says, you know, give me a regex that match all the number, including decibels. And so, and the output is a regular expression. So essentially, you you know, in this work, you use a neural network that, you know, consume the sentence and output the, you know, the syntax of, of the program. Right? So typically, it's solved by some kind of semantic parsing and, and neural network. And, but what we'll do today is more like the puzzle kind, right? The kind that, you know, uh, the PL crowd, we know kind of better, which is by examples and constraint, which is the spec is a particular input output example, right? So this Bob is some, some height and then I map into a number and then I give it to the synthesizer and then it gives me the program, right? So it's different space of utterances we're, we're considering. And so this is typically solved by search, uh, by enumeration and check or neural guided, and et cetera, et cetera. And so really we can ask the Josh Tannenbaum question is like, what's the best synthesizer, right? And basically the right answer is always, it's, it's gonna be a person. And so it's good to have a benchmark is, you know, I thought of a very nice one is programming as a helpful expert, right? So like, would you rather do program synthesis with Miniset or do you want to do program synthesis with someone who knows the language that you can talk to? And I'm sure most of you would prefer the latter. Um, and so what are some of the advantages of an expert? Well, you can, they can know what you want and then they can suggest novel feature that can do all these like awesome things. And I guess why grad student exists, right? Because maybe professor doesn't really want to touch the code. They just tell the student, here's some idea, go, go implement, right? 
And then really you can say the, the key is there's two aspects, which is expertise and communication. And both are important, right? You could think of expertise as kind of the synthesis technology, right? Like given the specification, can you even find the program, right? The, the more expert you are, the more likely you're able to find the program. But on this talk, you really want to focus on the communicative aspect. And so this brings up synthesis with pragmatics, which is you know, one of many aspects of communication that I'm bringing into, hopefully into synthesis. Um, and particularly we'll be talking about rational speech acts um, in the context of program synthesis for, for this talk. And so um, let's do some kind of more program synthesis example, which I think is funny. Uh, imagine I give you the input output example two goes to four and I ask you, can you come up with a program that maps two to four? And sure, right? So like there are some good guesses of human like it, right? Two, two times X is a good program. And X plus two is also a good program, right? But you know, if you encode the space of arithmetic expression into a synthesizer and you ask the synthesizer, give me a program, it's gonna give you maybe like this one, right? Um, not wrong, but you know, probably not what you're thinking about, right? Because it's you know too complicated. Um, what are some ways that one can fix it? Well, one way to fix it would be the user, you know, or the designer can say, I like simple programs. And so here is a simple program. <laughs> it just ignores the input and give you four, right? And so really these kind of disambiguation problem is big and then we hope to solve this in, in some nice and principled way. And so ambiguity formally is the user give you a set of examples, uh, E1 to EM. And then there are multiple programs that satisfy the set of examples. And what we want to really solve is a problem of how we can order uh, if there's you know, three, maybe there's a total of 10 programs, we want to order them, but if there's a, you know, a very large program we want to propose like the most likely one in a sense that's, that's human intuitive. Right? And so let's look at some prior work of dealing with you know, the particular problem of uh, ambiguity. What, what, do, what do prior works kind of look at? Well, one way is to don't resolve at all, which is you know, the approach of sketch and set and things like that, where the probability of generating a program under some data set is literally give me anything uniformly at random as long as my program satisfies the data set, right? And so um, if you are communicating with these kind of a synthesizer, what can you do? Well, you know, it's kind of like talking to the white robot, right? You need to keep giving it more and more and more and more examples until it can no longer be ambiguous, right? So that's clearly not very good if the space of program is big and, and, and it requires a lot of examples. And so what are some other ways you could do it? Well, maybe, you know, there's a global ranking we can do irrespective of, of utterance. Maybe we always prefer shorter programs. And so this is really saying the probability of generating a program is proportional to, well, the first part we still want, right? The one we still want consistency, but we are also ranking the programs by, you know, preferring shorter one way with a with a tie. But you could also have a more adaptive ranking that depends on what you say, right? So rather than a global ranking of program, maybe I have different ranking depends on the example that you give me. And so, really, one way you can model that is by doing some kind of a weighted uh, interpolation between how likely is a person to use a particular utterance D to talk about a program, right? So you, you still do consistency, but the way you rank the consistent program is really a weight, um, which is a feature kind of that takes in the program and, and the data set you use, and then you can learn from human interaction which pair is more likely to, to occur. And once you learn this, you could have a data, kind of an adaptive ranking over the program. But really, the, I would argue that both approaches are either handcrafted, which, you know, it's good, but it's maybe you need to do it for any new domain. And, you know, in other cases, they need to exonate by, by real data, which is not available to you, right? When you build a programming language right off the bat, like you don't have interactive data. So what do you do? And so uh, more generally, we can think about what are some of the common themes of these prior work. Really, um, if your synthesizer is, um, you know, communicating back to you any arbitrary program, the mental model of the user when talking to the synthesizer is, well, I need to constrain it until it can no longer make a mistake. And then, so how do you improve that is we can add, we can learn a prior and likelihood and 
kind of overall theme would be, you know, under this framework, we, we know how human would likely to refer to programs, and then we want the machine to adapt to the way of human, right, by learning from human data, either by crafting a heuristic or learning from human interaction. So in this work, we want to do the opposite, which is, um, can we build some principles of communication into the synthesizer itself and have human adapt to it? So it's the other way. So rather than having the, you know, the machine adopt the conventions of human by learning from data, why don't we just build some principles of optimalities into the synthesizer and then hope that the human can adopt, right? So this is kind of the most uncertain and YOLO part of the research. It's like, oh, I built this synthesizer. It has a certain convention and tendencies of communication. And you just throw a person at it and be like, please play with it for a few rounds and see if you could get used to the weird convention that it can do. And so now what is the thing that's in the robot? It's called rational speech act. So we'll, we'll go into some math and hopefully we can all kind of understand it because it's not really complicated uh, math. It's actually pretty, pretty straightforward. I hope to get through. And so we'll be using this uh, very simple example. Um, here are two guys. One um, had glasses and the other one uh, had glasses and a hat. And then I just tell you glasses. I'm referring to the person with glasses. And you know, if we did a previous example, you mean you know that I'm referring to the guy on the on the left. Right? And so we'll mathematically derive these kind of a communication with uh, rational speech acts. And so I guess I just want to emphasize that rational speech acts is a deterministic procedure, which is really really nice. Is you you get some basic, you give it some basic premise of the communication game, and then you just run, you crank the algorithm, and then you get a pair of speaker and listener that's efficient at solving the reference game. And so the input to the algorithm is called a meaning matrix. And so let's look at the meaning matrix of uh, the hat and glasses uh, reference game. So on the columns are the hypothesis. And so the, the first column is the guy that's only wearing the glasses. The right column is the guy that's wearing the glasses and the hat. And the rows are the utterances you can use. So the first row is the utterance glasses and the second row is the utterance hat. And so the meaning matrix really is just a 2D consistency, right? Where you have an entry of one if, you know, the, I guess some kind of entailment relation, right? Like if the hypothesis is consistent with the utterance then an entry of zero, which is to say, um, the, the, the hypothesis of, of just wearing glasses is incompatible with the utterances of hat, right? So that's zero. And what we do is a nice kind of recursive update. Um, so the procedure, right? So what we can do is let's first, so to start off with RSA, we always start with the basic literal listener that's not pragmatic. So the mental image I want you to have is maybe like sat or sketch. So what does a listener like that look like? It's saying the probability of proposed W, uh, so W here denotes programming and U here denotes utterances and examples. So the probability of proposing a program condition on utterances is proportional to the consistency between the pair and some prior. And so let's assume a, a uniform prior. And what does that mean when we take this proportion is we need to normalize it across the rows. And so if you look at this matrix here, if I give you the utterance G for uh, glasses, the probability distribution on the hypothesis is 50-50. So 50% of the time, the synthesizer will give you just glasses and 50% of the time it's gonna give you hats and glasses. And the probability distribution of the word hat since it's inconsistent with glasses, it's only gonna be glasses and hat, right? So here is a probability distribution and then you read it a row at a time. So given a condition on, on, on G, what's the probability over, over the Ws, right? And so here is a recursive reasoning part is to build a pragmatic speaker. It turns out that you could have a pragmatic speaker proportional to the literal listener. By that, I mean, if I'm the speaker, what's my job? My job is, given a hypothesis, I need to generate an utterance. So how likely am I going to generate an utterance given a hypothesis? Well, it is proportional to how likely the listener is going to recover the hypothesis given the utterance. So this is kind of just a proportionality. And what does this mean? That means you take this matrix uh, of L0, 
and you normalize across the columns. And so once you do this normalization, you, you notice something very interesting, which is if I want to refer to the hypothesis as a speaker, imagine I'm given the hypothesis, the person just wearing glasses, the only thing I can say is glasses, right? Because I know the listener, if I give the listener hat, it's not gonna recover the right hypothesis. And if I'm given the hypothesis wearing glasses and hat, you see something interesting, right? I'm more likely to refer to you that using the utterance hat. And so we can continue to play this game by saying, well, what's the pragmatic listener up on top? Which is, again, I'm proportional to the speaker, which is if I'm a synthesizer, I'm a listener, my job is given an utterance, give you a distribution over hypothesis. And how am I gonna rank this? I'm gonna rank you by assuming you are a pragmatic speaker. And so what this means is we take another normalization, but instead of across column, we do it across rows. And so now we see the, uh, the effect that we want, right? Given the utterance glasses, the synthesizer is more likely to refer to the guy that's only wearing glasses rather than glasses and a hat. You can see this is a very simple deterministic procedure that you can do. And what you end up is a pair, let's call the S1 for informative speaker and L1 for informative listener. You end up with a pair that's usually speaking are very good at communicating with each other. And so let's look at communication with rational speech act. Um, so here on top is a meaning matrix of ones and zero. You do some deterministic procedure, RSA, by doing some normalization across columns and rows. And then you end up with a speaker on the left and you end up with a listener on the right. And they are a very good, they are good partners in communication in the sense that given a hypothesis, imagine I give a sample particular hypothesis, and then the speaker, what the speaker will do is the speaker will take in the hypothesis condition on it and generate utterance according to its speaking distribution. Right? So if the hypothesis is glasses, uh, I'm gonna generate the word glasses. If the hypothesis glass and hat, I'm going to generate more likely the utterance hat. So now I sample a particular utterance and the utterance gets passed into the listener that recovers the hypothesis by running the listener distribution by looking at the, the roles, right? And you just index into that in proposal. And then we can recover the hypothesis. And so the premise, um, and this is just done by people in, you know, Noah Goodman and, um, you know, wonderful uh, cognitive scientists that, with computation flavor, that they've, they've shown that in general, these kind of uh, procedure can derive a good pair uh, of S1 and L1 that in practice, they communicate uh, well with each other given some kind of initial meaning matrix. And so you can see how this is very easily uh, translate into programs, right? Which is instead of thinking about hypothesis and utterances, what we really want are programs and examples. And we want kind of consistency in, in this big uh, 2D uh, matrix, right? And so um, really communicating program with rational speech hack is really the same picture as before, um, where we give you a giant meaning matrix, right? It's a very big one where all the columns are different programs as hypothesis and all the roles are examples as utterances. We can do this normalization process. Um, and what we end up is a pair of speaker and listeners such that with some understanding of each other and they can communicate well to refer to programs using, using examples. Um, what we do in this research is really, you know, we take these speaker and then we are like, okay, fine. Why don't we throw a human in the place of the S1 speaker and, and pray that it work? Uh, it does work, so that's good. Um, but, but that's essentially the research in, in, in a cartoon, right? So we do some deterministic procedure so that, you know, in algorithm space, we have a pair of communication that's efficient. And what we do is we swap out uh, one of the, the, the roles with a, a human. And hopefully the human can quickly adapt to, to talk like S1, right? And so um, let's see. So there are some details about handling a set of examples. I, uh, I guess just maybe read the paper. I don't wanna, it, essentially like the set of utterances is exponential in the number of example, right? So with two example, it's like number of basic example squared and with three example it's cubed and so on. So we, we need to kind of do some, do some you know, algorithm to take care of that, but it, it's, not too, it's not too difficult, but um, 
So to formally kind of bring it back to the example that we, we've showed, you know, in the beginning, um, really, we, you know, this is the mini matrix, what it looked like. So um, on the column, we have different, I guess, rather than the syntax of the program, we work over the semantics or rendering of the program. So on, on the rows, on the column, we have different program executions and on the rows, we have different uh, utterances we can use to refer to them. And really it's the whole bunch of ones and zeros. And then I think this matrix has about like 13,000 columns and like 500 rows or something. So it's not, there is some like, we, we call it version space algebra, but it's really like caching. So we did some like smart caching to make sure that, you know, we, we need to do the normalization, right? We, we did some smarts to make sure that process is possible. But I think if we do, you know, proper version space, we could, we could do better, but you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not too good at that. So. Uh, so just to show you some results, we run this on uh, Mechanical Turks with you know fifty around around fifty people, and what you could see is with the blue uh, pragmatics robot, uh, on average people use less symbol uh, to communicate with with the blue robot, and at the end uh, we see that the people voted like oh we like the blue one the white one is kind of stupid, um, and then we also have some fairly it's there, but it's like it's like not strong enough. But like there is some learning characteristic where we can see the human adopt kind of to the convention of the blue robot. Um, I didn't include it here, but we we also have an end user survey where we ask the user what are some of your strategies, and so it's really interesting. Without telling the user at all how to interact with this robot, just have them interact with the system. Um, there are some definitely some strategies. So to communicate with a white robot, the user says something, oh, I need to use a lot of pebbles because they tend to go off the margin. And with a blue robot, the user said, well, it, it gets it. I just have to show you the corners and putting something on the inside. So uh, I thought that was very, very interesting. And so, yeah, so essentially this is some other plot. Yeah, whatever, that's not it. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about uh, future directions and open some conversations so we can we can have some QA uh, at the end. So, you know, we want to, you know, we want to do it for real, you know, like the, the space of program we considered, you know, it's not trivial, it's like fairly big, but you know, it's only like 10,000, right? It's not like, you know, a hundred bits long program. So what can we do with that? And then also we want to think about, so, right, so the first line is thinking about what are some of the different hypotheses we can do? And what are some of the other utterances we can do, right? We can refer to program by some other ways, which is natural language and drawing and demonstration. Um, and those domain is, I think even, even in you know, cognitive science, those are open problems because um, for example, it's very easy to think about the alternative of what you didn't say, but for natural language, are you gonna generate all the sentence that you didn't use to describe something, right? That's like a very difficult uh, task. And what I want to quickly, talk about today is, can we use a prior to amortize uh, pragmatics? And which is, I think it's extremely, extremely relevant to, to this group here. Um, essentially what we want is a global ranking of programs in such a way that they approximate the behavior of the pragmatic synthesizer. And I have some, I, I messed with that, I'll show you. Um, so amortization of pragmatics using a prior. Um, so what's the problem of synthesis with pragmatic is that it's slow, right? Because remember the, the recursive, like it needs to build on top and with each recursion you do, you need to solve these like normalization constant, which require you to integrate over all the alternative, right? So that's really the uh, counterfactual reasoning, which is extremely, extremely expensive. And so in term of time is square in the number of hypotheses and the number of utterances and square in the number of examples. So, you know, if you take W to be the space of program, like squaring that, you're dead, right? Uh, and so, but with prior, it's much faster, right? So what we do is we simply, um, imagine we have a global ranking of programs, and then let's imagine at inference synthesis time, we just filter all the consistent program and rank them using the global ranking function. Uh, can that even work, right? Because we know that, I, I, I won't have time to show today, but we know that you know pragmatic reasoning have a certain nuances. 
such that a global ranking function cannot handle, which is depending on the thing that you say, I may order things differently. But for the most time, I do think we order things in a prior like way in a consistent fashion. So the idea is, can we do some kind of an imitation such that at compile time, right, we can use a very expensive pragmatic synthesizer to give you, hey, here are how things can be ranked. And we learn from the way these things are ranked and compile that down into a global ranking of programs so that at inference time, uh, computation is going to be very, very efficient. And so really can, can a prior approximate L1 under some uh, circumstances. So what is the circumstances? Um, really, the circumstances would be imagine if the speaker is being pragmatic, right? I don't imagine we can find a prior that line up with the pragmatic reasoning, but I could imagine them lining up given the fact that the user is being informative, right? So that's a condition I, I'm likely, I, I want to take, which is, you know, over, over some data set that's generated by a informative speaker, can I find a distribution that is modeled by a prior plus consistency such that the distribution of the amortized prior one is close to the, the distribution of, of, the, uh, of the pragmatic one, which is expensive to compute, right? And those two distribution line up, we could kind of have the cake and eat it too, right? And so there's can be some metric over distribution optimized by gradients, but you know, alternatively, what something that one can do is just learning a ranking function, right? Where the idea will simply be, um, I guess in the cartoon world, like, I guess, imagine, right, imagine, imagine if you could enumerate all your programs in like a finite list. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna sort them. So each time I, I, I give a particular order from a pragmatic listener, I'm going to sort this list to be like, you know, it, does this order in the global ranking, is it consistent with the, the, the pragmatic listener? If it's not, I'm gonna swap them. And so by generating random uh, interaction between a pragmatic speaker and a pragmatic listener, I give a lot of ordering relationships and then I would just keep swapping uh, the global ordering of program until they become more or less consistent. Um, and so that way we essentially cached, right, the, the pragmatic uh, reasoning as a prior. Um, we know we're gonna lose some nuances uh, of, of pragmatic reasoning, but hopefully we capture uh, most of it, right? And so let me show you an example where here we have, now instead of the white robot and the blue robot, I have the gray robot and, and gray is the color of fast. And, um, and so uh, I'll show you, uh, if I give you this example, you can see how, oh shit, wait, can I put it here? All right, you can see how the blue one spends more time thinking with a dot, dot, dot sign. You see that, it, it spends a bit thinking, right? So in fact, this um, synthesizer, you see how the blue one is slower? And all the gray robot is doing is, is it literally ordered all the programs. And in, in enumeration, it just enumerate over all the program in this global ordering and give you the first one that, that match. Right. And so you could see the behavior of the, the blue robot and gray robot are lining up, given your utterance are pragmatic. But if I give you a kind of a non-pragmatic ordering, for example, if I give you this example, uh, I guess they still kind of line up, right? But not, not so well, right? Um, so um, this really is very interesting because it's like over only over the assumption that the user is somewhat you know, pragmatic do these distribution line up, otherwise they, they don't line up as well. And so, uh, let's see. Yes, so this is prior. Um, and so really, let's wrap it up, right? This is a summary of this work. Um, we perform a deterministic procedure called Rational Speech Act. We derive a pair of efficient communicators, S1 and L1. We throw away L1 and be like, user, please. And it worked. And what we want to do, kind of like a long-term vision is, you know, we want some common grounds that's communication driven, right? So pragmatic and rational speech act is like, you know, one idea is we can borrow from, you know, cognitive linguistics that studies, and then, you know, it's, it's really good, right? It kind of worked out really well. I, I, and there's some, a lot of other works. And I think, I guess for you guys that UCSD has one of the best uh, cognitive science department in the world, I think, and then so, 
you know, maybe talk to them there. They're, they're really cool. Um, and really we want, you know, to emulate this process of, you know, deriving a, a speaker, which is a, and, and a listener, right? Like you want the synthesizer to be a guy, right? Like that, that, that's kind of what we want. And yeah, that, that's the end. Cool. Yeah, thanks. And um, questions and things. Thanks. Ooh, ooh.